Well, good morning, everyone. I'm absolutely delighted and honored to have the opportunity to be here. As you saw from my brief uh, CV, I've been an academic almost all of my professional life. I only uh, joined UNESCO three years ago, and often people ask me, well, what do you miss about you know, being located at a university, being a professor? And really, it's being around the students, being among the students and the young people. And so it makes me very, very happy to be here today with a group of uh, really impressive, exciting students. And I hope you're going to challenge me with a lot of questions uh, after uh, my presentation. Um, so basically, what I want to do in this presentation is to give you an overview of uh, how we see the integration of science, technology, and society at UNESCO and give you some examples of uh, the work that we do. You know, uh, we are an intergovernmental organization. I'll just explain a little bit more about the actual pragmatics of how science works in an intergovernmental organization, but it's very different from uh, industry. It's very different from universities, though we collaborate extensively with them, but it has its own unique strategic uh, opportunities that it offers us. And uh, we're always excited about expanding our partnerships, particularly with young people. So it's, uh, I think, very useful for you to understand what, how this actually works. I'll give some thoughts also about uh, how we view the roles of uh, youth in the transformation of science and engineering. But before I begin my prepared remarks, one of the things I would like to say, uh, just stress how important the collaborations with Korean partners have been in the so programs in science uh, at UNESCO. Uh, Korea has been one of the superstar collaborators in our programs ranging from oceans to biodiversity to freshwater to science policy and uh, has the most effective uh, national commission for UNESCO. So UNESCO is very grateful to uh, Korea for the uh, long-term support and partnership. So uh, in, when thinking about where UNESCO fits in the uh, world of international science, I think it's useful to think about uh, some of the changes that are underway in, in the scientific community. I mean, science and engineering is not a static uh, community, and there's been very rapid evolution in a number of directions. I think one of the key things is, as you know, uh, really changes in international participation and in patterns of collaboration worldwide. Uh, Changes, I think one of the things that I know since my career uh, has begun is that there's an increasing sense of urgency, recognition of the, the uh, vital necessity of acting now in terms of the challenges facing the plan planet. And also the way we actually do science and engineering has changed a great deal in, in recent decades. All of this is relevant for you know, how we can move forward in a better integration of science, technology, and society. So, uh, for, so something about the changing landscape of uh, science, I refer you to the UNESCO, most recent UNESCO science report of 2010, which looks at uh, sort of a snapshot of uh, international science and comes out every five years. It's available online. And what you'll see, one of the notable things over that five-year period was uh, the emergence and rise of new players. In other words, the previously dominating and still very strong triad of North America, Europe, and Japan, uh, it, its dominance is decreasing while other players are rising. Of course, the most notable rise is in China, but uh, other players worldwide are also uh, increasing their science capacity very rapidly. Unfortunately, in the least developed countries, uh, the picture is not very good and, and not uh, terribly much uh, insufficient progress, I would say. One of the other things about international patterns is that the collaboration patterns are changing greatly. This is from uh, 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 Nature Biotechnology, and it shows um, South-South cooperations. In other words, uh, the top one is uh, in-stage commercialization, co collaborations involving R&D. And as you can see, they're enormous. And they're actually a big part of our UNESCO strategy, is to promote South-South cooperation in science and technology. In terms of uh, the challenges facing the planet, I don't need to elaborate these in any detail. We know uh, a lot about them. I'm sure you're aware of them. You're aware that they're highly coupled. and uh, the, 
it behooves us, all of us, and particularly the younger members of the scientific and engineering community to increasingly target our work uh, to address these challenges, which are all interdisciplinary and all involve uh, social and human dimensions in addition to the technical dimensions. In terms of the changing practice of science, of, of course, uh, what we've seen is a real blurring of dis disciplinary boundaries, a blurring between even what we call science and what we call engineering, uh, a, a recognition, particularly among the younger scientific communities, about the absolute necessity of working in interdisciplinary teams. I think uh, another uh, factor, uh, as evidenced by your presence here today, is that uh, the scientific community, particularly the younger scientists, are increasingly recognizing how important it is to engage uh, in the policy dimensions of our work. In other words, not just to do the research and put it on a shelf or put it online and expect that it's going to have an impact, but to also be involved in uh, working with the society on imp implementations. The multi-sector partnerships, so that's almost uh, uh, given at this stage. The uh, emergence of what has been uh, uh, dubbed the fourth paradigm by uh, Microsoft research people, you know, the data-intensive science and engineering, I think is a very important phenomenon. And uh, in terms of UNESCO, our, our main role is really in capacity building for science and engineering in the developing world, and it's important that we work with member states uh, to make sure that as new patterns, new modes of doing science emerge, uh, they're not left further behind. And lastly, I think a very intriguing one is the emergence of possibilities for citizen science. In other words, engaging uh, regular folks, in including often uh, students and, uh, and others, in large-scale uh, data collection and interpretation activities. And this has come in the areas of astronomy, is uh, notable, but also uh, biodiversity. And I believe there's a huge, a huge scope of opportunities for extending work in those areas. So those are what I would uh, characterize as the changing uh, dimensions of science. Within those changing dimensions, UNESCO's vision for, for uh, STI, for su sustainable development, is quite a comprehensive one. What you'll find in the international science community, if you take a look at what happened in the Rio Plus 20 conference last year, uh, by the way, you'll see that the science for sustainable development is often pigeonholed into the environmental sciences. And the importance of things like the health sciences, the agricultural sciences, uh, is, is often ignored. But uh, from our point of view, we believe that all of these, including the very most basic sciences, have powerful roles to play in sustainable development. And we also feel that linking a science and engineering enterprise to poverty eradication, uh, job creation, entrepreneurship is uh, 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 paramount. So when you think about all of the elements of uh, international science and technology ecosystems, one of the most important ones, perhaps in my opinion actually the most important one, are the higher education institutions. And that's because the higher education institutions like KAIST actually deliver a lot of the research, uh, train the next generation of leaders, as well as when things are working well, interact with other sectors of society, including uh, industry and um, uh, government, civil society. Uh, of course, also, uh, our higher education institutions train the next generation of teachers uh, in science. So, in all of the above, uh, the international collaborations have become more and more uh, important, and I believe that we need new, uh, more creative models of collaborating across uh, national boundaries. This is a, a graphic meant to illustrate uh, sort of a UNESCO uh, vision of science, technology, and innovation for uh, development. Very, very much people-centered. At UNESCO, we're fortunate because uh, we have a very broad mandate. You know, we were created after World War II, as the UN itself was, not too much longer after that, as the specialized agency for the UN system with three main areas, education, science, and culture. And so the S in UNESCO is for science. And that may seem like an incredibly broad mandate, and it is. But the advantage it gives us is that within the house, uh, we can work uh, across these boundaries Work, have the social scientists working together with the education people, working together with the science people. 
So uh, we are one player among uh, so many worldwide, but we do have a, a character in international science that's different from any other. And so what kind of activities do we need to focus on, rather the activities that are done better through UNESCO and our partners than done in universities, industrial research labs, government labs, et cetera? Well, one of our main functions is to mobilize international collaboration on challenges that any one nation can't address alone, such as, you know, oceans. Often these things are deeply political, and a space that is indeed and is regarded as neutral by the international community to come together and discuss these issues is important. So that's one of the main roles that we play, and I'll, I'll give you uh, some example, examples. The other uh, role is you know, capacity building for our member states in strengthening their uh, STI ecosystems. I'll explain a little bit more about what we mean on this. And in all, our overall mandate is, is uh, since uh, wars began in the minds of men, it is in the minds of men that the defenses of peace must be constructed. That's part of the uh, UNESCO Constitution. And um, so we focus on areas where we can realize uh, the goal of using science to, uh, uh, for conflict uh, prevention and conflict resolution. And an, a very uh, striking example of this is work in transboundary aquifers. The majority of the uh, aquifers, as well as uh, rivers worldwide, are shared across national boundaries. And uh, bringing together the scientific communities to actually be able to understand the resource uh, is a strategic in way to bringing together uh, the governments to actually talk about equitable sharing of the resources. And we, we have a lot of work in this area. So, uh, so what does science at UNESCO actually look like? I mentioned these intergovernmental programs. I'll, I'll give some examples again in a minute. But in addition to, we're headquartered at Paris. We've got uh, scientists in field offices around the world five main science bureaus for Africa, Asia, that happens to be in Jakarta, uh, Venice, Cairo, and Nairobi. But we also have uh, these affiliated uh, UNESCO uh, research centers and institutes. Uh, among the, the institutes, we have the uh, Abdul Salam International Center for Theoretical Physics in Trieste, uh, and the uh, UNESCO IAG, which is a hydrological institution in Delft. And in addition to that, there's about 30 uh, UNESCO affiliated research centers that our member states set up in collaboration with us with a mandate to work in a particular area, but with also a commitment to help UNESCO work with uh, other countries, particularly from the developing world, on that particular theme. And I wanted to mention one that's under development here in Daejeon, which we're very excited about. We've been collaborating for a long time with an organization called the World Technolopolis Association, WTA. And WTA works on the design of science parks, technology incubators, science cities, et cetera. So they work with UNESCO in uh, uh, less developed countries around the world in helping uh, to design these kinds of you know, physical urban spaces. Uh, for the promotion of science, technology, and innovation. And we're very excited about having that new center in Daejeon. And also we have UNESCO chairs around the world in science and engineering, about 300 of them. So we're able to mobilize them in working on our uh, topics of uh, uh, priority. Another great strategic advantage we have is the, the sites. I'm sure you've all heard of UNESCO World Heritage Sites. Uh, but in addition to the World Heritage Sites, we have uh, sites in the Man in the Biosphere program, and a new uh, kind of site called Geoparks uh, that we work with. Um, when we do science, we do it in collaboration with our member states. So in each of the 195 member states of UNESCO, in the country level, there's a national commission. And we, in fact, are the only one of 49 UN agencies that has these national commissions. And the national commission in uh, in Korea then is a venue for us to connect with uh, you know, wide branches of uh, civil society. And I'm gonna give you some contact info uh, about that soon and there's some information available to you about the Korean uh, uh, National Commissions. Then for each of the scientific programs, they will end up having a, a national committee 
to bring together the scientists in that area. And so, for example, for water, there's a national committee for the International Hydrological Program, et cetera. That means that we have an unusually broad uh, uh, fingers out into a wide network of collaboration, which is sometimes hard to find for individual uh, research uh, institutions. And again, as I mentioned uh, previously, uh, we're lucky that we enjoy uh, the uh, reputation as a neutral uh, party for uh, uh, discussion of re uh, tough issues. And so we've been recently asked by the UN Secretary General, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon to convene for him a high-level scientific advisory uh, board to uh, serve both him and as well as the UN system as a whole. Because of course, we don't, we're not the only science body in the UN. There's health and WHO and agriculture-related stuff and FAO, environmental-related stuff and UNEP. But the idea is to have a very high-level group which will help the UN as a whole uh, be more effective on science for sustainable development. So I mentioned that we have two main roles, mobilizing international science collaboration and helping our member states in building uh, their science, technology, and innovation ecosystem. So here's some of the uh, main, really strongest programs that we have for water, IHP, International Hydrological Program, for the oceans, the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission, the Man and the Biosphere Program, and the International Geosciences Program. What's interesting about these programs, because most of them have been around for about 40 years, and this is a graphical representation of the current strategic plan of the water program, is that, well, they started out as more or less strictly scientific uh, collaboration. Uh, for example, in this case, hydrologists worldwide setting a research agenda and working together. That's good in its own right. But with time, these programs came to map onto more of actually the themes of this conference in that integrating the social dimensions of water, the gender dimensions of water, uh, became a core, core elements of the uh, international uh, agenda setting process through the IHP. And also, for my mind, a very good thing, they have as one of their key themes, water education for sustainable development. So that ranges everything from you know, primary school education through to uh, you know, water, water degree programs in universities through to technical training for uh, water professionals. So it's, a, it's a, an interesting uh, evolution of, and all of the programs have sort of have been making this type of evolution, which I think is really, as I said, maps onto some of the trends in international science that I, that I mentioned earlier. So I, I just wanted to show you a little bit about the Man in the Biosphere uh, program and these biosphere reserves, the World Network of Biosphere Reserves. Now Korea is uh, very active in this program. A new biosphere reserve was just uh, selected a few months ago in Gochang. Um, and the difference between the World Heritage Sites and the biosphere reserves is, is quite striking. So the World Heritage Sites, they have cultural sites, and they have natural sites. Natural sites are areas that are of world uh, importance uh, that are uh, kept in a very pristine uh, fashion. And, but the biosphere reserves, the idea is, yes, they're there to protect important elements of biodiversity, but we know that people have to interact <coughs> with these environments, and there has to be economic development, and there has to be jobs, and so they have a concept of a core zone and then a buffer zone where economic activity is encouraged. So as such, they offer for us uh, spaces, we call them living labs for sustainable development because the complex interactions between protecting the environment on the one hand and uh, people's economic uh, opportunities on the other are addressed. And so they might be interesting uh, spaces for you to look at here in Korea. And we also, the geoparks, also have the same uh, characteristic. Uh, just a little bit about the, uh, uh, the, the IOC for oceans. And this, this is the world's metabody uh, for collection of uh, data on such issues as ocean acidification, uh, and also for things like um, 
the tsunami uh, early warning systems around the world. So. I, I, again, I mentioned that the geoparks have similar character to the, uh, the biosphere reserves, and again, I think they're worth checking out uh, for you folks. So that's one, the one big umbrella. The second umbrella, as I said, is, is this uh, uh, strengthening STI ecosystems. And again, we work with uh, member states as individual countries, but we also work with regions like in South Africa, the Sadak region, the Southern African states as a group. And we, we envision this having three main pillars. Of course, you need good STI policies if you're going to have strong uh, science and innovation systems, so we work on, on the policy quite extensively. Uh, but also, you have to have strong institutions, and so institutional capacity building, working with uh, member states on uh, identifying uh, strategic areas for uh, research uh, development, helping work with them on creating individual centers or creating networks of centers, working with universities on higher education transformation, that falls under this second bullet. And the third bullet is really a lot of the people stuff. So uh, enhancing popular understanding, participation, and support. And that would range everything from working with the science museum community worldwide and helping, particularly in the developing world, helping member states create science museums, working with science journalists, but also working, we've got an interesting program, Science for Parliamentarians, in uh, which you know, some nations in the world have quite advanced systems of uh, uh, parliamentary uh, subcommittees on science and technology, which actually work well in uh, getting uh, an, an under, so one can have a uh, data-based understanding of uh, uh, the consequences of the decisions that they, they make. And we have a very strong focus in UNESCO of promoting women in science and engineering. And uh, you, one of our flagship programs is the UNESCO L'Oreal Women in Science Award. Uh, this is just some examples of the kind of you know, country support, regional level support we provide in policy. Africa, by the way, is UNESCO's overall strategic regional priority, and our other overarching priority is gender equality. So uh, up until maybe three years ago, most of the science policy work was done simply on a country-by-country -country basis. And we have a, a new uh, director of that division, the ex-minister of science and technology and higher education from Mozambique, who's really made a lot of interesting changes to try and work on global analysis of STI policy instruments and making them accessible in a way so people can share the best practice and quantitative understanding about what we know about uh, the evolution of uh, various uh, indicators uh, so, so we're quite excited about these global uh, policy initiatives. Since I joined UNESCO, I, I encountered a lot of strong stuff, but wanted to uh, uh, launch some er new stuff in areas that I thought to be important. We clearly were very strong in environmental science and in policy, but in terms of economic development, uh, engineering is very important, obviously for the member states and, and the member states from the developing world very strongly were pressing for uh, of strengthening engineering at UNESCO. Uh, so actually the resolution which introduced this initiative came from, engineering initiative came from South Africa. So uh, almost two years ago now we, we launched this UNESCO engineering initiative which I'll tell you a little bit about. The work in disasters at UNESCO um, spans many different kinds of disasters. I, I mentioned tsunamis. We have a leading role worldwide in, in tsunami warning systems. But also, we, we're, we're very good in water-related disasters. We house the International Flood Initiative, the International Drought Initiative. And one of our uh, most active uh, UNESCO-affiliated research centers in Japan called iCharm really is the strongest place in terms of international collaborations in response to any water-related hazard. But in the geosciences, we, we have the International Landslide Initiative, and we also have uh, networks of uh, seismologists in the earth, earthquake area. But all of this was taking place in a scattered way within UNESCO, so uh, we've brought this together in sort of a cross-cutting thematic area of disasters. In biodiversity, having the uh, the, the blessing of these sites, when you, when you get to get put together the man in the biosphere sites, the 
uh, uh, natural World Heritage Sites and the so-called Ramsar Sites, which are uh, wetland sites, um, you have, I think it's 15% of the world's protected areas. So we have this uh, you know, capacity through the communities, the schools in these areas, to really have, and have in the past played in, in uh, important roles, but we have the possibility to play yet more important roles in terms of uh, biodiversity assessments and uh, ecosystem change. And as I mentioned the science education a number of times previously, but it's a passion for us at UNESCO and we're trying to uh, strengthen that. And so I guess the other areas that are sort of cross-cutting are our work in climate change and on small island developing states, SIDS. Um, I'm gonna talk very briefly about um, the engineering initiative being in a highly technological institution here. Again, the African member states, other developing country member states, Arab member states, says, we want more engineering from UNESCO. We want more support in engineering. And so we actually have uh, quite a lot of uh, engineering capacity, both in in-house in our staff and, and in terms of our related institutions, particularly in, in, in areas uh, related to water uh, and disasters, but not, not exclusively. Uh, but we have the links to the ministries of science and technology, ministries of education, higher education. So uh, working on uh, innovations in engineering education, making project-based, uh, interdisciplinary uh, 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 research uh, efforts, both at undergraduate and graduate level, become more part of the curriculum is a main goal of ours, and we'd love to talk to anybody who shares that goal. We also have a, a, a big passion for uh, youth leadership, so working, um, working with uh, student societies of, of engineering, uh, whether they be on a professional basis, or a disciplinary basis, or on a thematic basis, like uh, engineering and uh, uh, for sustainable development, you know, we are very anxious to continue to build those partnerships. So since we formally launched this initiative, we've gotten a huge amount of enthusiastic support from the professional societies, uh, are, are a big, big uh, part of that. And mo mostly they're excited about working with UNESCO. I mean, IEEE has 400,000 members around the world. They do not need UNESCO in terms of uh, uh, the, you know, that uh, kind of uh, capacity building. What they need UNESCO for, why they want to work with us, is they want to have a bigger impact in the developing world. Electrical engineering for sustainable development, and in particular, they're weak in Africa. And so by working with us, we can collaborate with them with the African Union, and uh, at the ministerial level in the various countries in Africa, to design, uh, together with other industrial partners, uh, an engineering action agenda for Africa. But we have other, other, other sets of partners that we uh, work with. I'm not gonna go into a great deal of de de detail here, but one of the themes is the student design, international student design competitions, which might be of interest uh, to you guys to talk about a little bit more. And the other is you know, networks of young engineers around the world. And the amazing Kuwaiti Society of Engineers is, uh, which is about 70% women, by the way, uh, they have uh, shown a lot of leadership, not only within the Gulf region, uh, but uh, in other regions in bringing young engineers together. So we'd like to do things like link up these uh, youth organizations. I mentioned these centers. I'm really happy because there's two new ones which should be voted into official existence in November. Uh, in Denmark, a new center uh, at Aalborg University on so-called problem-based uh, engineering education. They have a 30-year history of really integrating concrete interdisciplinary pro projects into the curriculum. And so by becoming a UNESCO center, they commit themselves to working with other countries uh, with a focus on the developing world in these new types of approaches. And then the Chinese Academy of Engineering in, in Zhejiang University in Hangzhou is creating a new center with us to focus on the challenges of, of big data, data-intensive science and engineering. Another uh, new project is with the German Professional Society, the nine technical universities of Berlin, and, nine, uh, and a number of uh, key German industries like Volkswagen and, and Bosch and others on multinational team-based uh, engineer, integrated engineering education and research. So leaving engineering for a while, we have a, also a focus on 
in our education sector and our communications and information sector, as well as in the science sector on uh, open educational resources. So we have developed an exciting partnership with the Nature Publishing Group on uh, development of an open access, full life sciences curriculum for both university and, and secondary school uh, students available on a variety of platforms. So that's uh, work underway. Uh, one of our babies that we're the most proud of, which got a lot of attention last year, is CERN. CERN was formed out of uh, UNESCO, again along the theme after World War II of international science collaboration as a means to promote peace. And so our baby has gotten much bigger than, than uh, we have. And together with uh, CERN, though, we continue to work closely. Uh, we're working with them on uh, the modernization of physics education in Africa with a focus on secondary education and working with physics teachers, but also on uh, the capacity building at the national level for digital libraries. Disasters I already missed, mentioned, so the interest of time, I'm going to skip that. But we've had very, very heavy involvement in, in floods-related stuff. And right now, we have work that I'm very proud of underway in the Horn of Africa on the, the drought situation, which, as, as many of you know, we had uh, last year the, the worst drought in 60 years with many, many deaths. And so working together with USGS, some industrial partners and others on some remote sense approaches which combine remote sensing with uh, you know, hydrogeological surveys to identify areas for groundwater for emergency situations. So I'm going to uh, close very quickly with this last slide because I want to give you guys uh, some time for questions. But I put together a few thoughts about uh, the roles for youth, not only in the international, the integration of science, technology, engineering, and society, but also in collaboration with us on our programs. As I said, Korea has been a superstar for us in science at UNESCO. You've got a fantastic office in downtown Seoul. So those of you from Korea, if you're interested in sort of international opportunities, that build on some of the areas that we work in in UNESCO, I really urge you to get in touch with them and I'll have their uh, appropriate email on the next slide. But I think one of the most important roles for the youth is for pushing for change within the institutions. And um, you know, a lot of curricular innovation has actually come from a more bottoms up approach of students designing activities on an exploratory basis getting professors excited, and then uh, having new activities become part of the formal curriculum. So I would really uh, urge uh, for you to work on that within your uh, uh, university structures to move beyond these traditional uh, lecture-based courses and exams, which are not really, in my opinion, a good use of uh, either the, the time of either faculty members or of students. Of course, getting involved with uh, the, your local communities and working directly with them on, on uh, not their analysis of their problems and co-design of solutions. Again, the professional societies and uh, the youth organizations really are a strategic lever from our discussions uh, around the world with many of them. It's clear that they are most anxious to have uh, youth play more active leadership roles. And in terms of international collaboration, again, uh, pushing at the student level for the institutions to integrate these international collaborative research opportunities more into the curriculum. And what do I mean by that? Often, uh, in prestigious institutions like this one, there is a huge amount of international collaboration taking place already in the research domain. Like, your professors are already collaborating with the best people in their field around the world. And for the graduate students, and to some degree the undergraduate, I'm sure that's happening. You're being introduced to individual research groups around the world. But for the undergraduate students, in general, uh, there's, there's a bifurcation in most institutions. And that bifurcation is between the traditional coursework that you're going through, you know, lectures, exams, et cetera, and you might have some research opportunities. But the international part is not integrated with ever, hardly ever with the research part. 
And we know, we have experience from looking at uh, under, the, the career trajectories of undergraduate students who engage in international project-based research activities, that it has a huge effect, impact on their professional development. And it's also a strategy for attracting more people into science and engineering. So this may have been a bit of a long-winded way for me to urge you uh, to seek out opportunities where you actually work on concrete projects together with uh, partner uh, students in uh, universities around the world and urge your uh, university to make this part of a regular curriculum instead of an optional summer activity that you might do uh, at your own expense. And lastly, you guys are the best communicators. Compared to you, we older folks are in general quite boring. And so if you know, there's issues that need to be uh, uh, focused on, uh, where it's either whether it's local authorities or whether even at the national level or, or at the provincial level, that a policy needs to be changed, you should be at the forefront in uh, pushing these issues, articulating the concerns of the youth to press, to social media, and to responsible authorities in general. So I'm going to stop now. As, as, as I said, I, I hope we've left uh, at least 15 minutes for questions. Uh, you can uh, take a look at these uh, aforementioned conclusions, it turns out. But I do urge uh, those of you who are uh, here in Korea to get in touch with the National Commission if you have more interest in, in uh, pursuing any, any of these issues or opportunities that I've described. If you're from outside of Korea, please feel free to get in touch with me uh, directly in terms of opportunities to link uh, your efforts with the work of uh, UNESCO. So thank you very much. Professor, thank you for your informative yet captivating presentation and lecture. And I'd like to ask the identity of UNESCO. Since it overthrew my university life, I've seen UNESCO a large times in the conference, and they do a kind of flagship programs for children. At the same time, science, as you mentioned in your lecture. So could I ask what kind of field that UNESCO work Specifically. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you for your question, first of all. Um, I, th I think I've outlined the science agenda for UNESCO pretty comprehensively. What I did not do was talk very much about the other, other work that's underway in UNESCO. Uh, education is the largest branch of UNESCO in terms of budget, in terms of staff numbers, etc. And they have a number of uh, flagship efforts. Uh, one is called Education for All. And Education for All is a global initiative uh, to achieve universal access to primary education. Uh, they issue something called the Global Monitoring Report, the GMR. I think it comes out every two years to look at the progress towards those goals. Some countries have made very rapid progress, but it doesn't look like the goals are going to be met. And uh, um, new push is definitely needed. In education, they also, we were also asked by uh, UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, we lead an Education First initiative, which brings together uh, people from the private sector, the governments, et cetera, to focus on, again, achieving the universally agreed uh, uh, education goals. And again, of course, Korea has been an important uh, partner in that. Another key focus in education is on teacher training. And um, uh, you know, clearly, strategically very important for education systems. They also work on uh, sort of research and policy on the financing of education systems. And uh, another area that they're uh, strong in is technical and vocational type of education. So, there's a huge education effort, and some of it overlaps with uh, what we do in science, uh, some of the teacher training activities, uh, some of the higher education systems activities, but they're complementary. Uh, in culture, the, they're, they're 
a huge amount of their time is devoted to these various conventions. So uh, there's a, a convention for the World Heritage Sites. And so there's, you know, international processes by which a site is nominated by its country and it goes through all of these validation procedures. But there's seven of these conventions. So there's one, for example, on intangible cultural heritage. And there was a recent uh, Korean, what was that? The, I can't remember. Some sort of th theatric form, uh, I think. But anyway, so they, uh, there's a, there's a convention that deals with the return of stolen cultural heritage, which is a very important uh, you know, political uh, issue, of course. So cu culture deals with all these conventions, but they also deal with uh, cultural industries and trying to uh, you know, promote sustainable development through uh, you know, uh, job creation in uh, areas related to culture, whether it's uh, more traditional things like handicrafts or more uh, modern things like, uh, you know, media creation, uh, et cetera. So that's culture. And then we have, lastly, a sector, a separate sector called CI, Communications and Information. And they have a responsibility in the UN system for the topic of uh, freedom of the press and safety of journalists, which is a really important mandate that we're very proud to hold. But they also do a lot of work that overlaps with us in the science sector on ICTs for sustainable development, on ICTs in, uh, in education, uh, et cetera. So I, next time I give a talk like this, I will, based on your question, I will make sure to have a better overview of what the other sectors do at uh, UNESCO, not just science. Thank you. Thank you. You said I am very keen interested in the climate change, mm -hmm. and as the President Obama in the speech uh, in the Georgia in the Georgia University. So, do you, the UNESCO as an organization, have any special plan or ambition to combat the climate change? Yes, we do. Across across the various uh, branches, what we call sectors of UNESCO, we have quite a lot of activities in climate change and. Um, they include uh, some of the, they include the following. This is a subset, of course. Uh, in terms of the research assessments of climate change, uh, for example, almost all of the data about uh, the effect of climate change on the oceans, it's uh, integrated under the work of what I mentioned to you, the IOC, et cetera. So gathering uh, data uh, in climate change is, is very important. Uh, projection scenarios on world water resources under climate change. Uh, that's work that's done underneath the, uh, the IHP, the water program that I talked about. So there's a lot of the science. Utilizing the sites uh, uh, for, for uh, climate change research, such as uh, glaciology. Uh, we have you know, sites from Kazakhstan uh, to Peru that we work together with a local uh, glaciological community. So there's scientific research that we, we do. Also climate change education, uh, educational materials, uh, uh, going down from kids to you know not so young kids. And um, we have a role, in, a very interesting role in indigenous knowledge in climate change. So uh, we headed in the IPCC, we headed uh, uh, that uh, work in that theme. And there's a recent book called Weathering Uncertainties, which, talk, which shows a, talks about indigenous knowledge and climate change. So that's education, science, culture. So, so within the house, we have sort of cross-cutting work in the area of, uh, of climate change. Thank you. Now I'm happy there's questions. Well, thank you for your speech, first of all, and I am a student in chemistry major. Uh, I have a rather simple question about your, some of your slides and the conclusion. Um, I was curious, how do you define sustainability or true sustainable development? Well, I think uh, we, we're, we're quite happy with the, uh, the definition of uh, 
uh, providing for the needs of the current generations without uh, jeopardizing the needs of the generations of the future. And I know I'm not quoting it exactly right from the Brundtland Commission, but uh, that's how we define it. Um, Um, I was just wondering if you could give a couple of examples. I know a few slides back you mentioned the youth projects uh -huh. uh, that's something you could do within UNESCO. Are there any particular shining examples that you could give of uh, really interesting youth projects that you've seen? Yes, yes. Um, the the um, work with, the, I mentioned the work with the uh, Kuwaiti Society of Engineers, and they've really mobilized uh, some engineering societies around the world to come together to work on uh, curricular change to have more engineering for sustainable uh, development. I think it's a, uh, I, I like that because it's an example of real student leadership but also engaging with the institutions in which they are embedded already in uh, some uh, concrete activities. Due to the time this year, we'll now take only one question. Um, thank you for your really awesome lecture, and I'm really happy to ask you. <laughs> I'm really interested in working in like international organization at UNESCO, but I but I wonder if. Uh, if there are a lot of projects or places that non-science major can um, participate. Actually, I'm in business. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the, uh, as I said, the, the scope of activities in UNESCO is, is very, very broad. And uh, so, um, and the economic dimensions or business dimensions are important for, uh, you know, almost everything that we do. So. Yes, but other UN agencies also. I, you know, I urge you to take a take a look at, at uh, the UN system. I mean, there's uh, um, advantages and disadvantages of being involved in a multi-governmental organization. There's a lot of bureaucracy, but then uh, in terms of having your work really be dedicated to something that you believe in, and having a lot of opportunities for international what we call rotation, people typically are, are supposed to move every three years, uh, that would be very good. I mean, the other, another major agency that might be interesting for you to look at would be UNEP, which has a big focus on green economies and, and uh, green financing models and, and uh, such matters. Thank you so much.